So the next uh, keynote uh, presentation is uh, by Fernando Perez on open science and reproducible research on Jupiter. That button, okay, perfect. Um, all right, well, folks, thank you so much for uh, the invitation to speak here. Um, it's a pleasure. Um, I. Um, I want to frame at first a little bit, and this is a framing that will probably be no surprise to many of you in the audience, but I think it's useful to kind of to set my own mindset around uh, why, I've, why I follow the path of um, getting involved with these, the building of these kinds of tools. Uh, and I think there's a, a variety of, of, of aspects uh, and perspectives to it. Uh, one is an ethical one that, uh, for me, uh, working openly is, is a way uh, of, of trying to build a fairer access to scientific data um, and scientific research. Uh, I come originally from Colombia. When I came to the U.S. to do my PhD in physics, I did have access, obviously, at, a, at an R1 institution uh, in the U.S. to proprietary software, but that, that was the kind of software that I knew would be difficult uh, for my former mentors back in Colombia to work with, and if I wanted to share my work with them uh, in a, a treating them as equal peers, uh, then it would be much harder to do so if it depended on a highly proprietary pipeline. Um, there's the aspect, a uh, human and social aspect, and it's the fact that uh, working openly uh, makes it much easier to collaborate with people and to build relationships in new communities in ways that are much harder when you're working in a highly proprietary uh, model. And for me, that has been true to the point where by by building these open communities, I've actually built also uh, amazing personal friendships in addition to productive professional collaborations. Um, there is an epistemological angle to it, which is that I think that if the mission of scientific research is in a sense to pry open the black box of nature and understand how it works, uh, I find it very hard to justify doing that by using tools which themselves I am legally prevented from opening and understanding how they work under threat of a lawsuit. Uh, and so I, I believe that those things were just fundamentally incompatible. And uh, finally, it was just that I'm a geek and Python was a cool language and I really got, uh, got very, uh, very uh, um, sucked into, into building uh, things with it. Um, all of this for me began back in 2001 when I was a graduate student trying to build a better interactive workflow for the kind of analysis processes that are familiar to all here but that are a little bit different from those that are used in industry where we are uh, effectively um, trying to iteratively explore a problem by running a little bit of code, looking at results, plots, etc., cetera, um, and gradually refine our analysis uh, in contrast to building, uh, building a library to solve a problem that has been well specified in advance, as may be a little bit more the case in, a, in an industrial software engineering setting. And, uh, and this began as a student procrastinating, telling his advisor, I'll be back tomorrow, this is going to just take an afternoon. It's been 17, 18 years now, and I'm still doing it, so... Never believe me when I give you a time estimate or anything. Uh, um, I do want to clarify, though, that from now on, everything that I'm going to say is not my work. Uh, it, the credit and the reason why we've been, we've been able to accomplish some of these things is because we have an incredible team of people who work on it. All the credit goes to these people. Um, and I do want to flag the fact that this is a team that has folks from industry. It has folks from academia. It has folks from government labs. It has folks who have joined us as volunteers in the open community. And so it's an incredibly diverse and interesting collaboration. And this is the kind of thing that has also been a challenge to build. We're trying to stay within the confines of academia. And that's a longer conversation that I don't have time for here in this talk, but I'm happy to have it over coffee or in breaks with anyone who's interested. Um, just as a quick show of hands, who here has used the IPython slash Jupyter notebook tools? Okay, so a good, a good chunk of you, not all. So for those of you who, who are not familiar with it, I'm going to give you kind of a very, very brief cliff notes. Uh, you can think of it to first approximation as Google Docs with a brain, if you will. Um, it's a web accessed environment that allows you to create documents. Those documents can contain text, formatted text, mathematics, equations, but they also include blocks of code, and those blocks of code are executed in line, and the results of that execution are stored in the same document. Um, so you can build interactive documents that have both narrative human natural language input combined with computational code um, and the results of those computations all within one live document and it's accessed through a web browser which means that you can work use it locally or on a whatever remote resource you're accessing, supercomputer, cloud, cluster, etc. using the exact same interface and the exact same UI. Um, very, very briefly to give kind of a, um, an analogy because I think it's useful, especially in a context like INCF where I think people care a lot about these, the, the notion of, of standards and protocols and, and ways of building open tools that actually facilitate collaboration and not just one, one team to do something. Um, 
what the core, what fundamental ideas are uh, in the in the in the in the Jupiter machinery, and those ideas can be perhaps seen by by using the analogy of how the web operates. Um, the web is to a highly simplified view of, of the web, we can think of two, two key pieces of its architecture are the HTTP and, and S and star family protocols that, re, that allow you to represent how two actors communicate uh, or, and, tra and transfer data between them. That interaction is typically between a web server and a web browser, but it doesn't have to be. And that's an important point, that by, by building a protocol, you can build services over HTTP reusing that protocol where the clients are not necessarily a web server that has a human reading a web page in front of it, but maybe something completely different, and you're still reusing the same infrastructure and architecture. Um, and second, when, we, when you want to encode that traffic in a manner that is useful for human consumption and human representation, HTML fulfills that, for, that purpose, uh, and you can represent pages and documents in that format. This is highly simplified. This is not a network architecture uh, talk, but I think it's useful for our purposes because we sort of have a similar a parallel in Jupiter in that on the one hand we have a well specified protocol, an interactive computing protocol, the details of it don't matter, there's a bunch of network connections, traffic, but the important points are the traffic, <coughs> the data of that traffic is encoded as JSON packets um, and the underlying transport is done with a specific networking library called 0MQ that happens to encode the communication patterns that made sense for representing the tasks of doing interactive computing as a protocol, by, by which I mean we sat down and we actually look at what do humans do when they execute code interactively in an exploratory manner. What do you do? You type code, you get results, you get graphics, you communicate queries over your objects. There's a, we literally sat down and listed what is happening and encoded all those as messages and communication patterns. Um, and 0MQ is a, is a networking library that is written in C++, has a very liberal license, it's very simple to compile and it's very fast. And by encoding a protocol on top of these two ideas, it meant that pretty much any programming language you could think of, uh, even though this project was born in the Python world, could use these ideas because 0MQ has bindings for just about anything you can think of. Has, uh, you can bind 0MQ to it and use it from just about any language you, can, you want. And JSON is also a standard that even though it comes from the JavaScript world, these days every language has bindings for JSON. So, that's how we represent the communication between sort of a human typing code and something executing that code and how that transfer of data should happen. And if that transfer of data was meant to represent a session that would be encoded in a document, then we also built a document format, which is the node document format, which actually is a capture of these JSON packets. So the document format is itself a JSON data structure, um, which has many, many benefits and some important drawbacks that we acknowledge and we're working on. Um, this protocol is effectively a web, a web age uh, capture and kind of formalization of the very basic ideas of interactive computing at the REPL, at the terminal, if you will, at the redevelop print loop. But what we did was we tried to represent any possible output that modern computational processes could produce. So it's not just printing output text, but it could also be your computations produce images, and that's a first class citizen. Um, you may produce objects that are mathematical objects, and those are uh, represented as first class objects. You may produce, obviously, HTML or JavaScript. These are things that web browsers are good at, so they are also first class citizens. And even interactive, live interactive computation. The idea that the output of a computation could be something that maintains live interactive controls, where as you operate in the browser, calls are made back to a computational engine and new data is computed. This is the kind of thing that we wanted to make very, very easy for working scientists because working scientists should not be in the business, for the most part, unless you really want to become a software engineer, should not be in the business of building complex software uh, graphical interfaces. That's typically a very time consuming and complex and difficult job. You need a really good software engineer to, get a good job, to do a good job on that. But it's perfectly sensible of a working scientist to say, I would like to explore what happens as I dra drag this particular parameter and I would like to see that quickly and easily and with minimal amounts of code. And so what we've done is we've written a library called IPy widgets as part of all of this that gives you a single, a one line of code uh, and add it in its simplest format, one line of code, you add this one line of code to a function and it turns that function into a live interactive computational object so that you can explore parameters while maintaining actually good code based tracking of what that GUI, mini GUI is doing for the purposes of reproducibility. 
of reproducibility. And I'm happy to talk more about that offline if anyone is interested in that. The point is we encoded in that protocol all the generic actions that we thought would be relevant. And we took the time to document and present that as, that as a formal independently specified protocol that could, yes, be used for Python because this was born out of the IPython uh, project, but that could potentially be used by other languages. And early in the process, we invited the team that was building the Julia programming language to spend a week with us while the IPython team was working on our code to try to implement those same ideas in Julia. And they built a Julia kernel that would allow you to do this exact same process but with no Python in the picture and instead a Julia backend. By the way, I want to congratulate the Julia folks because yesterday they released 1.0 of the language. Does anybody here in the room use Julia? Okay, a couple of you. It's a great language. If, if you haven't taken a look at Julia, as much as a, uh, of a Python fan as I am, I think this is a team that is doing an amazing job of rethinking high-level, high-productivity scientific programming languages in the basically taking lessons from MATLAB, taking lessons from Ruby, taking lessons from Python, and taking the very best of the last 10, 15 years of compiler research and type inference research and building, building a really, really amazing uh, language on top of having been able to build kind of a sustainable uh, community uh, to develop tools on top of it. So I don't have any specific project right now on Julia, but I want to give them a shout out because yesterday they, they reached an important milestone of reaching kind of 1.0 stability for the language. Anyway, after Julia had a, a, functioning, uh, a functioning kernel, uh, we had one of, uh, one of the uh, core uh, IPython devs at the time work with our folks to build an R. R support so that you could instead of Python have R in the back end and use the exact same process with R, and eventually that really became a standardization of this idea that has been widely adopted by the community. And today there's over a hundred different programming languages are supported in the back end. The advantage of this being that the only thing a community has to do if they want support for a new programming language is write an implementation of one tool, this thing called a kernel, and then after that, everything else in the Jupyter ecosystem is available to them. Um, and all of these languages are, are equally first-class citizens. There's nothing special about Python anymore. And that's what led to effectively IPython becoming Jupyter. And now what, while IPython still exists, is now the Python little bit in this, in this larger ecosystem. Um, I want to briefly talk about uh, where these parts, this part of the project is headed. So I've been talking about this thing that I mentioned, the notebook. Uh, it turns out that when you open that web application, you also get a file manager, you get a terminal emulator, you get a text editor. These are all things that are actually seem a little bit outside of our uh, core competency, but it turns out these are all things you need, especially if you're working remotely. If you're working on a, on a remote server, it turns out just having that document type interface is not enough for real world scientific research. So we ended up having to build all these other things. In the original code base, all of that was sort of Frankenstein style glommed up on top of one on top of one another. <coughs> not particularly modular or clean from an architectural perspective. So over the last few years, we've had a, a long running collaboration, especially with Bloomberg and, and also other companies to build, to reimagine these same ideas in a highly modular architecture that will allow you to build new interfaces that would have all these pieces be able to talk to each other, communicate with each other, and be mu much more extensible and easy to adapt to new scientific workflows. Um, it's called Jupyter Lab. Um, it's currently in sort of high high quality beta stage. We haven't completely uh, stopped developing the main notebook interface and it's still being maintained, but we're gradually transitioning to making Jupyter Lab the new interface. One important point is that it's a new interface. There's no changes to the underlying file formats, so your data and your existing documents don't change at all. But this new interface still has notebooks, but it allows you to put these other interface elements on the same footing as the original notebooks. Um, and now that we have an architecture where these protocols are spoken by the pieces of the UI, and these things are available to you as a developer as TypeScript components, um, then you can, yes, you can have a notebook over here, but you can also have, for example, a new view on a specific piece of output from this computation that is actually represented and synchronized 
um, in a different part. So that if, for example, you have a document and you have pieces of a visualization, you can keep those separately available and the computational links remain below. You can have that same document viewed as a PDF in the environment. You can go beyond notebooks. Now the architecture has been kind of broken up into pieces. So if you have, say, a document, a markdown document, that document can be rendered live. Most text editors these days are capable of doing that. But in Jupyter, you can connect to that document a computational console and say, this document actually has code attached to it. And as I hit shift enter in my markdown document, not only do I want to see it rendered, I actually want to see that code executed. So now you can begin basically recomposing pieces of your own workflow for your needs with, with the underlying uh, components, not necessarily having them be uh, a, a notebook document. The same ideas apply to data. So you can have, within the interface, you can view data. And if you open an image file, you can view it obviously as an image. But the system is modular. So if you have a CSV file, you may not want to view it as a CSV. Maybe a tabular representation is more convenient, so you can view that. You can open a JSON file, and by default, JSON looks just like a bunch of nested curly braces. It's typically pretty hard to read. It turns out that, for example, this is JSON that corresponds to a specific schema called GeoJSON to encode geospatial data. If you, if you, if you have the GeoJSON viewer loaded, then you can also open that same file in its more natural human, in human valuable representation, which is a map with the encoded data represented on a live zoomable map. Um, this is an example of opening a FASTA, a FASTA file, which is uh, uh, a <coughs> genome assembly uh, format. And this is, this is a specific FASTA file that, that has multiple, uh, multiple assemblies of a, a Zika genome. And the community had built a viewer for it uh, that is an, a third-party tool. And it was very easy to say, oh, for my use case, we were interested in viewing this kind of data. Uh, this is, uh, and I want the, the most useful thing for them, for, for this community to, to be able to, to see is the alignment of all of these particular genomes that are uh, meant to represent the same organism. So by building, by wrapping the original, uh, the, the original viewer for this data format, now you can view that as a standalone, as a standalone proper scrollable and whatnot um, interface. But importantly, not only do you have uh, a live viewer for that data, that exact same tool can now, once the protocols understand it, you can write a teeny wrapper, this much code, it really amounts to a couple of lines of new code, that will then allow you to view, have the same tool as something you can call in your code. And this is a recurring pattern in the design, that it's not just about building graphical tools, it's about building tools that may be used interactively, but have to be, it has to be possible to use them as recorded script control executable code for the purposes of better practices in terms of reproducibility and whatnot. Um, and this, uh, I presented this a week ago at Neurah Academy in Seattle, which is still uh, ongoing, and made this point that this is meant to be a community extensible tool. And within 24 hours, somebody, uh, which I'll mention in a minute, a team w went out, and by the next morning, they had wrapped a Nifty viewer. They, have ra they had wrapped the Papaya Nifty viewer so that you could load Nifty images uh, within the same interface and have all of the interactive functionality of Papaya for viewing Nifties in this format. Um, this was done by um, Anisha Keshavan, Nate Back, and Chris, uh, Chris, I don't know if Chris is here in the other session, uh, but they did it in, in a matter of 24 hours, they had, um, they had a wrapper built up. So this, this was a good, a good illustration of the value of documenting and building these things based on open standards and a well-defined set of interfaces for these things to communicate. That team saw at the presentation, and by the next morning, they had, uh, they had a wrapper um, up and running. So, that, that's kind of a, a section on, on the technical machinery of the underlying interface. Um, I want to talk a little bit about reproducibility, uh, about uh, reproducible research, um, specifically about a project called Binder that, were, that has been um, in development for a few years um, and that tries to give us tools to make a reality, this quote that I, off, that I use quite often from uh, uh, Buckheit and Donahoe back in 1995, where they made the argument that at this point we should really, really be thinking about something beyond uh, PDFs for uh, the publication of computationally intensive research. Um, Donahoe is a applied mathematician, statistician, however you want to slice it. But I think this quote is highly relevant these days in just about any scientific field that is computationally intensive. Um, I subscribe absolutely to this philosophy. And over the years, what we've tried to build 
And this is actually a project that had its origins in neuroscience. The first viable version of Binder and the creation of the name in the original project was done by Jeremy Freeman back when he was a neuroscientist uh, working at Janilia Farm. Uh, Jeremy is now at the Chen Zuckerberg Science Initiative. Um, and uh, what Binder offers is a, a very simple web interface to try to help working scientists um, create, be able to give others a completely self-contained reproducible <laughs> entity that they can uh, share with others to re-execute an entire working pipeline with minimal effort. As long as they follow certain guidelines uh, of having their code in a repository, by default GitHub, but it could be others, um, encoding certain pieces of the interface uh, of the access to, the, to the, the code and execution with Jupyter or related tools, we'll see about that uh, more in a minute, very importantly, documenting which are the dependencies that their code needs to run. So it's not just you give me a repo, but you tell me in a machine readable format what dependencies the code needs. The, the system will actually package all that up in a Docker container, will actually ship it over into uh, Kubernetes, will do all the work for you in the background so that you as a scientist, as long as you follow the right guidelines, all you have to do is give us a, a URL of your GitHub repo, click a button, and then you will get a live executable instance of that deployed for you automatically. Uh, we, we've had some uh, very satisfying examples of scientists adopting these, uh, these practices. Uh, you may have seen that in 2017, the discovery of gravitational waves uh, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. Um, this is, uh, for those of you who are not physicists, this was a prediction made by Einstein about 100 years prior that uh, large masses accelerating anywhere in the universe, would, would that acceleration would ripple, uh, would radiate, the, the energy from that acceleration would radiate away in the form of waves, but waves that travel at the speed of light, just like electromagnetic waves, but these are distortions not in electric and magnetic fields, but distortions in space-time itself. This was a theoretical prediction. Detecting that experimentally is a massively challenging problem. It's a feat of engineering that took 30 years to build against somewhat impossible odds for the experimentalists in the room. The detection problem is about a 21 orders of magnitude detection problem. So imagine sensing, um, sensing a distance roughly one thousandth of the diameter of a proton over, over uh, four kilometers uh, uh, shift. That's a brutally, brutally challenging problem. Um, it's kind of akin to finding, finding a person in an image of the Milky Way to give you a sense of orders of magnitude. Okay, it's about that hard. Um, what they did was they built two uh, detectors, uh, one in, in eastern Washington, one in Louisiana that are four kilometer long interferometers that bounce lasers back and forth. And there, if there's any perturbation in space time, that will produce a detectable interference pattern. The point is, uh, in September of 2015, these two interferometers detected uh, detected a signal that was actually uh, in unmistakably the merger of two, of two black holes, one, uh, roughly uh, 27 uh, solar masses in total and 1.3 billion light years away. This is the first figure on the main Physical Review Letters paper from that discovery. Uh, and first of all, I want to flag that all of this paper has been built with open source tools. So we've been working for 15, 17 years in building NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, etc. And for a long time, I remember going to conference and saying, oh, you, it's, it's okay to use open source tools for doing science. And this is what Python is, by the way. It's not, it's not just a geeky toy, it's a real tool. And this is one of the most high, pro high profile scientific efforts uh, today in the world. And for them, it was completely uh, a given that they would be using these tools to build, uh, to build all of their analysis. And furthermore, the, the Open Science Center from the LIGO collaboration actually has, um, actually has a page where all of their analyses are available as Jupyter Notebooks and you can download and run that yourself or you can click on it without downloading anything. You can click on it. If you go to the LIGO Open Science Center, you can click on it and you can run the analysis yourself on the web because it has been packaged in this binder format. So anyone in the world who has a web browser can run a child in Colombia who wants to learn about gravitational waves like I was when I was 16 could just with a, an internet connection and a web browser listen to this. I don't know if you heard at the very, very end. That little whoop, that is the chirp as in the final collapse of two, binary, of two black holes merging 1.3 billion light years away. Uh, 
turned the, the vibration turned into sound, and that that is the real sonification of the actual signal of what of what two black holes collapsing into each other sound like. And I think it's fantastic that we can we can build open tools to make this possible to anyone in the world. Um, so Binder itself, from a technical standpoint, uh, what it tries to do, uh, I think I have about ten minutes. Ten. Okay. So from a technical standpoint, what Binder tries to do is take take uh, take uh, contain uh, repositories and make turn them into reproducible containers it then will serve those containers to the user using uh, uh, Jupyter Hub. It then will provide an interface to make it easy to share those things with others called Binder Hub. And it finally has a service to run those for the public, which is a free, a free service that we run thanks to funding from the Moore Foundation. The first layer of that, repo to Docker, is something which, given a repo, will build a Docker image. It supports existing environment specifications in Python and R and many other languages. Um, and it's very specifically designed to be something of usage for the scientific community. Yes, this, this kind of thing can be useful for others, but we're not trying to build something for the web industry at large. We're trying to remain simply a tool to make it possible for scientists to easily and practically share their workflows with others. The, the rest of the Googles and the Amazons of the world have enough engineering resources to build tools like this for startups and whatnot. Our use case is the scientific workflows of everyday research. How do we make it possible to put, make, share those things in the cloud, on the web, with minimal effort for working scientists who don't want to become software engineers? Um, Jupyter Hub, the next layer on top of it, is something which fairly was designed originally to deploy uh, Jupyter notebooks on the cloud, but it actually can run non-Jupyter non environments. It basically allows you to authenticate users and spawn web services for them. So if you want uh, to run on your laptop, you can, but if you want to run the same thing and instead say, I want to authenticate my students with my campus authentication, you swap how they're authenticated and they run. If instead of running, uh, running services on that server, you say when they authenticate, I want them to run Docker containers in our, in our cluster on campus, you say, okay, I'm gonna change how those processes start and you can get that. <coughs> and then on top of it, Jupyter Hub, is designed, um, I'm sorry, Jupyter Hub, together with Kubernetes, which is open source technology coming out of Google, is designed to put this easily on the cloud with a scalable kind of industry standard set of tools to, to make management and dynamic scaling much easier. Um, and finally, on top of that, the Binder Hub interface allows you, gives both the web UI and the underlying APIs to manage these things and share them with others and do all of the, all of the launching. And I'm happy to talk about the details. That, that itself is available to the public as a, as a free service. It's an open service. We have funding from the Moore Foundation. The usage as the underlying infrastructure has gotten better. Usage has been skyrocketing. These days we're on the order of 10, 15,000 daily sessions um, of usage. Um, and one important point is that today, uh, or at least as of about a month ago, we are now seeing usage in from virtually the entire planet. And this is very satisfying to us that when we look at the data of user sessions, virtually every country in the world is now, has at least accessed some of these binders and has accessed, uh, has accessed the kind of content that people are sharing through these interfaces. So it kind of demonstrates that yes, this is of value to everyone, not just to people who have access to uh, expensive sort of first world scientific, uh, scientific resources. Um, I want to note that behind binder, there's a highly instrumented interface. We've been collecting a ton of data. All this data is available to you, to the public, uh, on how much it costs, what are the, what are the performance profiles, what are the resources used by this, because we want this to be something that ultimately we pushed into, we push into publishing pipelines, we federate out. Uh, our intent with running this public service was never to run a service that could satisfy the needs of everyone, but it was to have a proof of concept that would help us learn what is the cost and resource profile of something like this so that it can be federated and, and implemented and propagated across the scientific community, including potentially commercial publishers, actually, because we actually want something where the standards are open and under the control of the scientific community, but that hopefully also changes the behavior of uh, commercial publishers. Uh, and in the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about education uh, <coughs> and about how we've been trying at Berkeley to teach some of these things all the way down to the undergrad so that hopefully the next generation is better than us oldies in, in their practices. Um, so last fall, I taught a course called uh, 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 collaborative and reproducible data science at UC Berkeley. It was listed as a statistics course, but I actually had a, a mix of students, graduate and undergraduates. Um, a fantastic GSI who did a ton of crazy work. Um, the goal of this course was to teach students sort of what is 
collaborative and open science, what, it, what does it mean to work reproducibly? Why is that important, sort of from an ethical, epistemological, and social standpoint? Um, and so we had sort of weekly readings and lectures and discussions on, on the what and the why, the ideas. Um, but importantly, how to do it, how to actually do this. And so we spent a lot of time on the practical skills um, and especially focusing on making it an everyday practice, uh, making sure that the students realized that this was something that had to become a habit and a manner of working rather than saying, once I've submitted my manuscript, then I'll go back and clean it up and make it reproducible and document it and test it. Because no, you won't. By that time, it's way too late. Um, the skills that we built upon, and this is just a way, uh, you can do this same thing with different choices of the specific tools, but I think the actual ideas are all relevant, which was the idea of using version control, of writing code with pro open programming languages, of automating your processes rather than doing them manually, <coughs> of documenting everything with good open tools, of testing the work you do, of implementing continuous integration for your processes, and of wrapping it all up in these kinds of open containers. Um, importantly, the, this was done, trying to get Git and Python was, was done as, as a, an everyday part of the course. So the course itself was built as a GitHub repository. It was built with Sphinx so that the students would kind of get used to using these tools in, uh, in everyday practice in the sense that this is something that they would do like they brush their teeth. This is not about getting a root canal every, every few years. Um, it's about brushing your teeth and not having to have painful procedures done by the dentist. And so Git is kind of the toothbrush of science. Um, and one of the ways of making that stick was not only to teach them how to use it, but actually do all the homeworks uh, using something called GitHub Classroom, which basically facilitates turning in homework through GitHub um, and doing the entire course uh, as a matter of routine. The students had to create many, many, many repositories and collaborate with their peers and whatnot using these tools. Um, at the end of the course, they had to turn in a project, which actually was an original analysis, like a mini research project. Uh, they had to pick up their data, pick, find their own data, and then include or link it, if too large, the data in the repo, write code that had tests for it, write supporting analysis notebooks that would provide the underlying, basically back, going back to Donahoe's ideas, that would provide the rest uh, uh, of the background, a main narrative notebook that would be sort of the paper, um, all of the necessary dependencies and automation reproducibility support, and following best practices in terms of legal licensing, uh, code sharing, contributions, etc., cetera, um, that, uh, that would make the, the complete body of work uh, sort of follow what I think is a reasonable first order kind of standard playbook for this. And I'm really satisfied to say that it worked. Uh, all the students were able to do this. They turned in projects that had well-documented repositories, that had continuous integration builds that were green, that had binder buttons so that I could basically review their work by just clicking on one link and having a live version of their entire analysis. They included supporting analysis, supporting code, supporting test suites and endpoint sort of PDF, uh, PDF summaries. And so this is possible. It is possible to teach these things in a way that's adopted. Um, and finally, to close in the one minute I probably have, um, by building these kinds of open tools, we really can support infrastructure that is used by the community. I can talk for a long time about this. I won't in the interest of time. I only want to flag two points. One is that at Berkeley, we've invested very heavily in this. We have Jupyter Hubs that are accessible campus-wide. And today, those support the teaching of, uh, we have a new major in data science at Berkeley. And the two backbone courses of that major, the lower division one is called Data 8. The upper division one is called Data 100. I, this was me teaching Data 100 in the spring. I had about 650 students. In the fall, I'm going to have 800. Um, data 8 in the coming session is going to have 1,300 students. So we're teaching the entire campus in the largest halls on campus. They don't even all fit in there anymore. They have to view, many of them have to view the lectures online. We can teach the entire university these courses using these free resources by hosting it all in the open. Um, and it's uh, for the Canadians in the room. Pat yourselves in the back. Your country is doing a phenomenal job uh, of building national infrastructure with these tools. The Compute Canada team, uh, which provides national HPC infrastructure, has deployed Jupyter services for Canadian researchers. Syzygy is a project basically to have kind of one-click access to Jupyter Hub and Jupyter resources on, uh, on Canadian national infrastructure. But they, they also have projects in collaboration with the Alberta government to bring these same exact tool chains down to K through 12 education. I'm really, really excited with the things that I've seen from the folks here in Canada doing. So uh, I hope other countries that are less enlightened, we can learn from Canada. Anyway, uh, to wrap up, 
up, in addition to thanking the team, obviously I want to thank the people who have funded us, but I also want to flag again, as I mentioned on the team picture, the fact that this has been possible by a very interesting partnership between private foundations. The Simons Foundation was mentioned earlier. We've received especially funding from Sloan, Moore, and Helmsley Trusts. We've received some federal government funding, but also a lot of industry funding. And that's something that I think it's taken a ton of work to make this kind of of complicated multi-stakeholder process work, but it's been very valuable to do that work because we've been able to achieve things that would be, I think, very difficult under either a purely government-funded type effort, we, we would have never gotten here. Um, private foundation money is, is, is difficult to come by, and even though they've been incredibly generous with us, uh, it's the kind of thing that you can't always count on, but purely industrial efforts, even when companies work on open source, would not have gotten us here, and so I think there's a lot of value in trying to make this work. Um, so in closing, we've talked about a little bit of technology and hopefully these are interfaces that will give you some ideas for you to work on, how these tools provide infrastructure that can be uh, used by other organizations, and hopefully I've shown you that it's possible to also train a new generation of scientists uh, in these ideas. And thank you very much. Hopefully I'm not too much over time. There you go. So we have... Um, first, we have time for a couple of questions on this talk, and then in the program we've been allocated a bit of time for overall discussion of effectively sort of neural data science uh, uh, topics. So, uh, yes. Hey there, thanks so much both for your work and the talk. Um, so, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you, so, you have my binder, which in some ways you know, being on GitHub is sort of, I think, maybe GitHub-centric, you know, it, you know that, it, that it's got, you know, it's like a repo-centric, maybe not GitHub-centric. Mm -hmm. What is your sense of how, what best practices for integrating uh, uh, large data sets that maybe, like a whole classroom is using, rather than being pulled? Is there a way to have sort of a data-centric way, and how does that jive with GitHub, and what's your best practice for that? So, so that's, a, that's a very good question. I don't think we, we haven't converged on a single solution for that. I think there's two slightly different patterns for that. I think one is the question how to share uh, and make accessible data which is larger than you can reasonably shove into a repo uh, for the purposes of reproducible long-term publication. And I think for that, my thoughts are kind of following a little bit the kind of approach that the particle physicists have taken over the years, which is that the LHC has kind of level zero data, which is physically, well, first of all, a lot of it thrown away at level zero triggers, but then there's the, the first layer of data, which really cannot, cannot, is only replicated by worldwide infrastructure. You're not going to copy that anywhere. And then successively re smaller levels of triage of data, you could imagine putting some level, which is maybe too big, uh, too big to fit into a repo, but a little bit smaller than, say, 10 petabytes, putting that in an S3 bucket or some public bucket, which is persistent cold storage, uh, which the repo can pull from, so that if somebody wants to start the analysis at that level, they can pull from that. But I would actually suggest including a, a next level of pre-processed data, which can be included in the repo, which is where most people would start. So most people would start from a level that is maybe a couple hundred megs that can be put in the repo. Um, if they really want to validate what happened next, they can pull say a few gigs, 10 gigs, 50 gigs from an S3 bucket, and if they really need the five petabytes, they need to talk to you, something like that. And I think that's a pattern that we can converge on good practices for scientific reproducibility. The classroom large team use case, I think, is a little different in that there I would suggest deploying on, and that's the kind of thing that we are doing, is on the Jupyter Hub where you deploy, whether you do it cloud-based or on a campus cluster or on a supercomputer, then there, that's the place where you should have the equivalent to your S3 buckets, but you have the advantage of having a little bit more control over what exactly is the right path. Do you use a share file system? Do you use buckets? Do you use whatever technology? And you do it in that environment. And I think those two patterns are slightly different, and, and that's what we're doing with both. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Yeah. Um, so a question about, reproduci uh, question about reproducibility of the... Um, of the notebooks themselves. So I think Binder is a wonderful solution to this, but, um, and the education is also a great way to get everybody on board with the right process for this, but we're not going to be able to teach everyone, and very often we still have people who publish just the IPI and B files, and the question is, is there a way that we can get a, just a, you know, a dump of the imports uh, so that you can have a, a hope of reconstructing the environment that somebody was running that in? Yes, that's a that's a really good point. I think uh, we we haven't 
written that kind of tool, but it's actually quite straightforward to do it. It's quite straightforward to do it. First of all, I think that there's a few things that we can do with, um, uh, with, with educating people uh, about some really easy, th easy low effort things. There's, an, there's a little Jupyter extension called Watermark, and if you load that, if you pip install it and you, and you load ext Watermark, then a single call, it's one magic, will produce a dump a little text dump in the output, so at least it's printed. I had my students do that. That was one of the things they had to do, a little text dump that says, these are the versions of all the libraries imported. So at least it's like, you can read it, right? It's just at least it's printed in there. Even if they didn't build an environment and Docker container, at least it's right there. And that really is one line of code. And so getting people to do that, and worst comes to worst, yes, uh, pulling the code out and pulling the import statements out of a notebook is a 20 minute scripting exercise. We haven't done it, but we could sit down and over lunch and write that script. Good, good. Uh, excellent talk. So uh, two points. One is um, we've talked a lot about FAIR at this uh, conference and, you know, scholarship research, I include both, uh, requires both these types of dynamic environments where people are just very quickly going back and saying, oh, look, in five minutes I put this together. But there's also what the publishing, um, you know, community has generally provided as a level of stability, which means that you can find these things again in the future and you pay attention now to saying, okay, if this is an enduring scientific artifact or should be available for some period of time, I don't think you can ever guarantee that uh, some of these things are available forever given... Um, in the same way that uh, perhaps paper is. But um, how are you interacting with FAIR? Uh, so that's my one question. My second is just a plug because um, we're launching a new journal. I'm launching a new journal that's called NeuroCommons that is dedicated to exactly this type of science because I think it's about time that we have a platform where all of this can actually be uh, integrated with the publishing industry, so I just wanted to put a plug in for that. I think we paid for the drinks last night, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so, but just your comments on FAIR. So, yes, absolutely, and um, let's see. I, I think we're trying to honor those ideas, and, and actually by by having this little playbook that I suggested here, that I, I think I, I was hoping this summer I would find the time to write this up as a little, as a short little commentary paper with my GSI, and I may still have a long enough flight to do it, uh, because I think it's useful to kind of document this, this, this process and our experience and what worked and what didn't in that process. But my point is that I think the pre the presentation of this as a digital artifact tries to meet some of those layers in the sense that here there is something that is sort of the paper, right? This is, they were meant to include a PDF of the main narrative that doesn't have all the details and the computations and all the noise, but does have the scientific narrative. But the point is it is attached to these other artifacts that live together and they're well interconnected. And yes, if in 50 years Docker formats have changed enough that we can't even run this thing, hopefully this will still remain so we are no worse than we are today, but hopefully we are better in that all of the, the layers are there to keep digging one step further as your needs dictate so that if you really care more, you're willing to run the code. If you really care more, you're going to study it and download it and install it. So we're, we're trying, I think we're trying to genuinely honor those principles. Um, if you do feel that there's pieces of this that are missing, and I'm completely open to that idea, this is definitely a work in progress, I'd love to talk to you more because, because I'm sure there's a lot we can do better. But I think we are trying to honor those principles. Yeah. 